Hi, welcome to another edition of Motor Age How To. Now, if you recall last time, we used our scope to capture the waveforms from a camshaft position sensor and a crankshaft position sensor on our test vehicle, a 2013 Ram pickup. This week on How To, we'll talk about what we can use that pattern for. Stick around, that's coming up next. Welcome back. If you remember the last time on how to, we used our scope to capture this. It's the crankshaft camshaft signals from the 2013 Ram pickup that we use as our guinea pig. Now, a very common reason, reason for capturing these two patterns together is to check the relationship between the crankshaft and the camshaft to make sure they are in time. Um, timing belt that's off a tooth and misinstalled or jumped uh, slack and timing chain, uh, shear keyway, any of these kind of things can cause these signals to become out of sync and then the engine uh, isn't going to run right, right? It's going to be out of time. That's going to affect the ignition timing, it's going to affect the injector timing. So if you suspect there's a timing related issue, then this is one way you can check that very easily. Well, maybe not so much. There are some easier ways that I'm going to show you as the series progresses. But we'll stick with this one now because I've seen so many people posting these images on, on online social media groups that, that are focused on using scopes uh, as diagnostic tools, and there seems to be some big focus on this, so I figured that's a good place for us to start, too. Anyway, this is what we got off our 2013. Uh, we don't have any drivability issues with the, with the truck, uh, so I don't suspect there are any timing issues, but if I'm gonna use this as a tool to see if there are any uh, timing issues, the first thing I wanna do is see if I can determine the relationship between the patterns that I have. And I'm going to start by taking a closer look at the camshaft. I'm only using that because the pattern is very unique, isn't it? It starts off 3112, 3221, and then it repeats itself 3112, 3221. So I have a repetition there. It's very easy for me to figure out what one rotation of the camshaft is. So we'll use the scope's features to kind of look a little closer at that. You can see here I've got 3112, 3221 displayed. Uh, now I'm looking at one rotation of the camshaft or two rotations of the crankshaft, right? Now again, using these features, I can get an idea of what's lining up with what, especially with these nice distinctive delays here in the crankshaft signal. So what happens if I uh, superimpose those on, on, on each other? And again, very easy to manipulate, manipulate that with the scope. And we'll just kind of overlay the two and to see exactly uh, what it is that I can use as a benchmark, something as a comparison tool. And I think these two points are probably the ones I want to use. Here on the right, you can see that the uh, first pair of camshaft signals after the second triple uh, is almost bisected by the crankshaft signal. So that's a good benchmark to use. And then over here on the left side, uh, the first single signal from the camshaft is nearly bi uh, uh, bisected by the third. So uh, these are the two points I'm going to use as comparison. Now, compare to what? Uh, that's one of the drawbacks to using this as a method. In order for me to get any benefit from this, I have to have a known good pattern that's for the exact same vehicle as the one I'm working on. Um, these patterns are not uniform by any means, uh, certainly not from manufacturer to manufacturer, not from model to model, heck, not even model to year to model to year. So you have to have the exact same pattern uh, as the one you're working on in order to see if there's a problem. Now, uh, best way to do that, anytime you have your scope hooked up, save that pattern, document it, log it, keep it in a reference file you know, on your computer. Uh, next best. A lot of different resources available to you today. Uh, International Automotive Technicians Network has a waveform library uh, open to sponsoring members and a lot of other information. Uh, so uh, there's uh, other sites like uh, uh, Auto Nerds, uh, their, uh, the Pico site. Uh, there's just a lot of sources now for waveforms, a lot more than there used to be. Um, you can Google them for crying out loud and, and find known patterns. And uh, there are Facebook groups uh, that have members that are more than willing to help you with known good patterns. In fact, shout out here to Sean and uh, Miller and Justin Miller for uh, helping me with this. This is one that uh, Justin sent me for a known good pattern. This is actually a 2012 Ram pickup 5.7. So let's take a look and see if we can use this as a comparison tool. Well, right off the bat, we can see that the camshaft is the same. 
three one one two three two two one. So that's a good indication. Uh, the cam uh, crankshaft looks a little different though. So I'm not too sure about that. Let, let's proceed and see what, uh, like we did with the other one and see if we can make them work. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of overlay them just like we did on the last one. And then I wanna blow it up a little bit so I can see it a little better. Again, this is just using the, the features of this particular tool with the zoom features um, that I can just drop and drag a window over and, and blow it up where I, where I wanna see it. And we can see right off the bat that the two points that I saw earlier are the same here. Uh, especially here on the, on the first pair of two from the camshaft is bisected uh, by uh, the crankshaft. And then again, very similar over here on the left side on the first single tower from the camshaft, uh, nearly bisected there. But there is a distinct difference in the waveform patterns and how long the signal is generated on this one. And if you look at the schematics between the two vehicles, there is a small change, which could account for the difference in patterns. So considering right now what I have, that the two major key points seem to be lining up and the fact that I don't have any issues that would lead me to believe there's a timing issue with the 2013, I'm gonna call this a match and I'm gonna call the 2013 a known good pattern that I can keep later on for future reference. Again, ideally, if I did suspect a timing issue and I could not make a determination here, I would wanna see one from another 2013 to be absolutely sure or use another method for checking the timing relationship there are some easier ways to do that and we'll cover that in up, uh, upcoming issues. Now, the next thing I wanna say before we go for this edition of How To is to talk a little bit about being able to capture this kind of detail, being able to zoom in and still see a representation of the signal that you captured, an accurate representation. That's all based on something, at least with the Pico, that we call sampling, all right? Now, sampling is Oh, how can I describe this? Again, a digital storage oscilloscope or even a digital multimeter uh, does not read the signal that you're connected to in real time. It's not displaying a real time image. It's sampling. It's taking individual measurements very fast, very quickly, but still individual measure measurements that, are, that it uses as sample points on the graph. And if, again, going back to the, the days when you were in math class and you were doing graphs, the more dots that you have on your graph, the easier it is to connect the dots to get a true representation of the signal, correct? The more dots I have, the better the picture is gonna be, the more accurate the picture is gonna be. So let's just take a look at that here. We're gonna start with, with a, a long amount of time capture here. This is about a minute and a half's worth of data. And right now I have the scope set at 100,000 samples. Now that's not samples per second, that's samples per screen per screen. So that means that all the way across here, I have 100,000 data points, 100,000 data points. And I can pull up the properties. Let's take a closer look at that. 100,000 samples on the screen, but my effective sample rate is only 1,000 samples per second because I have so much time on the screen. See how the two are related? 100,000 samples uh, on the screen, but because there's so much time, it's only a thousand samples per second. That means I'm only getting a sample point every millisecond. I'm getting one point of data every millisecond. Now, if we zoom in and show that on a millisecond time base, this is what it's gonna look like. Again, all the divisions are set up at one millisecond apart. I'm only getting, uh, pulling up a thousand samples per second. And if I lay that out where you can see with the time rulers that I'm only taking one millisecond of time here, there's only one data point happening every millisecond. And then I get a graph representation like this. Is this something you recognize? I sure don't. It's because I don't have enough data points to reproduce an accurate signal. So let's change that. Again, we're gonna start with the same capture that we had before, but now I'm gonna crank up the samples per screen to 10 million. And that's exactly what I caught. Let me take a look here at the, at the data of the properties. Yeah, I've got 10 million samples on that screen, but now my effective sample rate is 100,000 samples per second instead of the 1,000 samples per second. Okay, I didn't change the time, I just changed the sample per screen uh, uh, spec drop down. So that's giving me a sample point, a data point every 10 microseconds. So now if I start to break that down as we did with the last one, on a per millisecond basis, you can see that now, because I have so many more 
data points, I'm drawing a much, much more accurate picture. So what does this mean, guys? Consider the signal that you're trying to capture and how you're trying to capture it. Uh, I, can have, I can have used the, the uh, first sample selection with no problem if I had reduced my time rate to so that I would see this, this signal on the screen on a single screen. You with me? I could have stuck with the same amount of samples per screen that I showed you in my very first example had I reduced my time rate down into the millisecond range, because then I would be plotting an effective sample rate much higher than I did when I was have a long time base. So uh, if I want to capture a long time base, I have to crank up the sample rate in order to get an accurate representation on a fast signal like this one. Uh, but at the same token, I can only hold but so much data. Uh, I think on my model, it's like 250 million samples is what the buffers will hold. So uh, these are all the kind of things that are getting more into an advanced scope use, and I admit I'm still <laughs> learning how to do all the advanced stuff. But I just want you to be aware that if you have a Pico or a scope that has an adjustable sample rate, consider what you're setting that for so you get a uh, pattern that is actually representative of what it was that you were connected to. And if you're not sure, there's a lot of resources you can go to for your particular scope. Hey, add your questions to the comments. I'll do my best to answer them for you. Um, not sure how it works on the snap-on scopes. I think they only have two, and I don't think they're adjustable, and I think it's affected by time base. So, hey, snap-on guys, if you know for sure and you can help out the rest of us, again, add that to the comments section so that we can benefit everyone. Um, that's going to do it for this edition of How To. I hope you got something out of it. Next time on How To, we're going to move on to using accessories with your scope to test a variety of systems on the vehicle. See you then.